in science and in my personal life. So there, look, mathematics is the language of science. Mathematics is the language. It's how you talk about science. Mathematics itself doesn't deal with the real world. It is a formal structure that allows you to use it as a language about science. Okay? What mathematics is? The establishment of truth called theorems. In mathematics, when we prove something, from rigorous, by rigorous deduction, from a problem each other than axioms and definitions. So you have a set of axioms, you have definitions, then you do logical thought and put together theorems. And those theorems are mathematical truths. Okay. So rigorous mathematics. The anatomy of the mathematical process, what we call mathematical modeling. The formulation of a given real world problem, often given in word form, as a math problem. Okay. So sometimes somebody may uh, just state a problem with words, and you have to go from that to formulate it into mathematics. Mathematical analysis, application of existing or new mathematical theory to find the solution of the problem at hand or demonstrate, perhaps, that the problem has no solution, okay? So, someone states a problem. We're gonna give an example of that. Then you try to analyze it and say, oh yes, there is a solution or there is, okay? Now, mathematical computation, which has become extremely popular since the birth of the computer, so let's say 1950s or later, is, okay, we don't know what that solution is, but can we approximate it numerically? That's what a computer does. That's all mathematical computation. And the department that I represent at Price is called computational and applied mathematics. We do a lot of computation. In the book, um, mathematics is a language that enables science. Many of our great pioneering scientists, Euler, the most prolific mathematician of all time, we still don't know what Euler did. Okay? He's one of, uh, instruct mathematical theory in order to pursue their love for science, physics, and astronomy. So look, Newton built mathematics, not because he was in love with mathematics, because he was in love with physics, with astronomy. But he couldn't do the problems he needed. He couldn't prove the things he wanted, so he built mathematics. Euler built mathematics. Okay. The two most impactful mathematical problems of all time. Now, there are groups here who are going to study this problem. So I'm not going to tell you a lot about it, but I want to tell you what I consider perhaps the two best known and impactful. Impactful means that it led to other great mathematics. It made a difference. Not just that it was a famous problem, but it made a difference. Like a writer or a musician or a big company. If they change the way something is done, that's impactful. If they're just popular, like the region, that's not impactful. The two most impactful problems of all time, the isoparametric problem and the logistical problem. So the isoparametric problem, in words, just says, determine from all simple closed planar curves of the same perimeter the one that encloses the greatest area. Take a piece of string, tie it, put it on the table, and put it in the shape that the biggest area. It's a circle. Everybody knows it's a circle. Okay. This picture shows you that in, in medieval times, Cities were built using the principle of the isoparametric problem. So this is Paris, uh, or Cologne, Germany, in the medieval times. And there's a river, and they built the city in the form of a circle. So that satisfies the isoparametric principle. Okay. Now, this is mathematics. Right? You're going to show this to, I'll say Sean, because Sean was in my class last semester, and he knows this anyway. That's what the mathematical model looks like um, of the isoparametric problem. Find the largest area, pick that area, um, find the largest area subject to uh, arc length. Okay? And it, so anyway, this is what it looks like. <laughs> the patricical problem. The patricical problem supplies two points, A and B, and um, in a vertical plane, ask for a specification of the shape of the curve along which a particle should travel 
that the aim is to move from point A to point B in the least time possible. The particle is assumed to start from rest, and it slides under the influence of gravity and without friction. So here, so you're building a slide for a child. And you would build it here to here, and you want the child to go down the fastest. But what should that path be? It's not a straight line. And put this curve, okay? So that's that's what the, the, the matricical problem is to find that curve right there to solve it. So Galileo, who I said before is one of the most brilliant of all time, he, based on physical experiments, conjectured or claimed that the solution to this was the arc of a circle. And the group that studied that will get into that. That's wrong. It's not the arc of a circle. So Galileo was wrong. So um, this is what it looks like. So Bernoulli, Johann Bernoulli in 1697 solved this problem. And here's what he said. I proposed the Procrestochrome problem and it being completely novel, not knowing that it had been attempted by Galileo. It is remarkable that this man, who was without contradiction the most clairvoyant person of his times, lacking, however, our new mathematical analysis, could incorrectly conjecture that the Procrestochrome was the arc of a circle. The message here is, it's better to be mildly brilliant and have the tools of mathematics at your disposal than to be extremely brilliant, like Galileo, and not have any mathematics. So if mathematics is there, you can do great things, even though there will be people who may be smarter. Okay, that's it. So now you understand that essentially math is removed from reality. It's used to model reality. You build a mathematical model and you try to do analysis. So I'm gonna give you two examples from my own personal life. So this is a personal application of math. The fair lane assignment in BMX bicycle racing. Um, and hopefully with that, you can look at the work that I can start talking to you. Okay, everyone can hear me? Okay, all right. Okay, great. So, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my personal background and kind of how I got to where I am here today. Uh, and then the second half of my talk, I'll talk to you about my research. Okay. So feel free to stop me at any time. It's kind of a means to an end. It's not the end in itself. Okay? It is important to get good grades. It is important to get information and knowledge into your brain, but you have to go beyond that, right? That is just kind of the basics. <laughs> um, and when I got into, you know, when I did my PhD, it was amazing. And I can definitely talk to you a lot more about my PhD experience, but it was the first time I felt like, you know, like concern, is this something that I can actually do? Um, but after talking to enough people, I, I came to the conclusion, heck, I mean, why not, right? Why not? That's easy. <laughs> um, and so at that point, I was like, you know, I have nothing to lose, right? If I go out there, I put myself out there, I don't get a job, oh, well, fine, I go get a different job, right? Like, I do, I do something else. But maybe I can at least try this for a little bit. All right. So that's kind of what led me to here. I've been a professor for the last eight years. Uh, a lot of ups and downs, obviously, a lot of things I've learned. Um, but I still love it. It's a lot of fun. Um, and now that I've been promoted, you know, I've just gotten thinking, okay, what is the next phase of my career? What more do I want to accomplish uh, with this position? Okay, so that kind of covers my personal history. Um, let me just tell you about what I do. Okay, I work. <laughs> I work in Hollywood. No. <laughs> um, but if you've seen any of these movies or any of the virus apocalypse zombie movies, you would think that I pretty much wrote all of those scripts, right? I think at least one of these kind of virus movies, I think the plot line is a female scientist engineered a virus for gene therapy to cure cancer. And I'm like, that was me. Uh, of our inventions, we call it the protease activatable virus or PAV. So the blue is the virus shell, and the red are those locks that we attach to the surface, locking them in place. This is just a theoretical model. Right? And this is what the viruses actually look like. Okay? These are the viruses that we've engineered. Um, and you look at them under high magnification. And this is what, so each of those little particles that look like little hexagons, that's an individual virus particle. These are only 25 nanometers in diameter. So you know nano, right? And so they get nine meters. Really, really small here. You cannot see these with your naked eye. And they work really beautifully. Uh, and so here, what I'm showing you in the black, you see there's nothing there. But what, what you're 
not staying in there, there's a whole lot of cells. Okay, a whole lot of cells. And onto that lot of cells, we added these viruses, still in the lock configuration. So when the viruses are locked, they actually can't deliver anything. But when the viruses become unlocked by those pathogens, you can see in this case, uh, it's able to deliver uh, a message that, that would turn the cells free. And it does it really well. Okay, so at this point, you're probably thinking, all right, okay, it sounds interesting. I learned about viruses, but where is the math, right? Because you guys are here about math, right? <laughs> Seems like you didn't really talk about math, all right? Well, you know what? Math is actually the foundation for everything. In my mind, the math math is actually kind of the kind of the unspoken language that holds our world together. We use math and equations, experiments to characterize our viruses to understand how many viruses. Um, in our experiments. We use math and equations to actually quantify their performance, to understand how well they're working, okay? And then finally, and probably, probably the most important uh, contribution of math, is that we use equations to model and predict how these devices, how these viruses would work if we were to inject them into the body, right? And that is really important, predictive power, right? Not only Okay, we inject the virus here, we think it's gonna work. No, we don't want that, right? We don't want, we think it's gonna work. We want an equation that to tell us, you know what, if you inject this much virus here, you're gonna be able to cure 90% of the people, all right? Something like that, get an actual metric. Okay, so I'm almost at the end here. Here is my take home point. <laughs> um, so I, I know I said a lot, um, but if there are only three things that you want to remember, okay, there's just three things I want you to take away from my talk today. First is, as you're kind of nav navigating through your education, right, and through your career, this is really, I think, in my mind, the most important question to answer for yourself. Do you feel like you're getting smarter, okay? With everything that you do, do you feel like your brain is getting a little bit bigger, okay? And if it's not, you're probably not stretching yourself, okay? You're, you're not, okay? reaching your capacity. You should always be operating at that edge of your capacity. And that's really the only way you're gonna get better. And do something that is actually meaningful and impactful to our society, okay? Second, we do cool things with viruses. So remember our labs, all that, okay? I think we do a lot of really interesting and crazy things with viruses. Hopefully not to create zombies, I promise. Um, but a lot of really fun uh, things. And lastly, even though I didn't really spend a lot of time talking about equations, um, it actually underlines everything that we do. In my mind, math really is the language of technology. And without math and math principles and equations you know, and ways of thinking about what we do in mathematical terms, we would not be able to do what we do. 